Hello, this is Jason Kendall and welcome to another one of my introductory astronomy lectures. Last time we talked about the nature of how Newton contributed the, way, the particle theory of light, which he called the corpuscular theory of light, where he said that every particle of light has its own color, and so the combination of the corpuscles makes white light, and a prism acts to separate out the various corpuscles into their various constituent colored bodies. And so this was a very compelling, compelling idea, and with the publication of Newton's optics in the latter part in 1704, it became the standard idea for how light works. But it wasn't totally settled because Newton's ideas about light didn't perfectly explain a lot of phenomena. So what happens next? Well, uh, Newton's theory about how light works, and remember a theory in this sense is the best explanation for the experimental facts of the day. And so as experimental facts change, then theories must also change. And that's exactly what happened. Because in the early part of the 19th century, all the way through the 19th century and into the 20th century, the nature of how we can actually make measurements radically changed, which radically changed our understanding of how things worked, and that meant we needed new theories. So it's not that people are dumb and they were wrong, it's that, it's that new, idea, new things come to light that need to be explained. So let's see what happened. All right. So Newton's idea carried the day for almost a century. And in 1803, Thomas Young came up with an amazing idea that actually had influence all the way through for 100 years and into the 20th century about that actually influenced quantum mechanics. But let's see what that is. What he did is he said, well, I really want to test this idea of corpuscular theory. He doubted it. And so he said, well, how can I do this? What he found is that he could take, make, uh, make, a, make a steady beam of light and have that go to a barrier. And that barrier can have two vertical slits in it. Now, at, I don't know, by 1803, he was able to make very narrow slits, the technology in advance, such that we could make slits, such that people could make slits not just a millimeter wide, but a thousand times smaller than a millimeter, a micron, very tiny slits. And so these tiny, tiny, tiny slits where light was allowed to go through. So let's say you take two of these slits and put them very close together, say a centimeter or so. And when you have light approach these two slits, all the light gets blocked except for these two vertical slits. And on the other side of the barrier, then the two slits act like point sources or vertical line sources. But if you make a measurement on the far side, the, wa the wave properties of the slits become evident. Now, if it was Newton's corpuscular theory, and you shoot a whole bunch of bullets, say now corpuscles are like bullets, and so the light source is like shooting bullets at something, the light goes to the two slits, and if it happens to, you can then draw a line from the source to the slit, to the wall behind the slit, and that would be a straight line. And so rays and bodies like corpuscles must necessarily follow straight lines. And so if the corpuscular theory of, of light was correct, then this experiment should show two spots on the far side uh, at the same width as the two slits are and roughly the same diameter of the slits. Maybe there's a little bit of spread due to randomness, but we should expect only two slits. Something different was discovered. What, uh, what Thomas Young discovered was that there was an alternating band of light and dark and light and dark and light and dark and light and dark and light and dark, and light and dark all the way out. Many alternating lights and darks. And if he moved the barrier, at least where, the, where you detected it, closer or farther away, the position of the light and dark locations changed. So what this meant was that light was acting like waves in water. And so if you would then take a barrier like a jetty or a dike where water is coming up through, then as the water goes through the, the opening, it spreads out and water can either construct it, water waves either constructively interfere or destructively interfere. And so what Young, Young proposed was that just like water waves, light waves follow what we call the superposition principle. Meaning if you have two waves and they collide against each other, so one's going like this and one's going like that, and they're moving, once they're moving towards each other, by the time they meet, if they're one's at the top at the point of meeting and one's at the bottom, the crest is at the here and the, and the trough is here, then the wave cancels each other out and there's no motion. 
But if the waves are, when they meet, they're both at a crest, they're both at a trough, then it doubles the height, depending. So if they're like this when they meet, then actually it's much deeper. Or if they're like this when they meet, so they come together and they meet, they rise much higher. So they add together. So the, the amplitudes of the waves meet or add together, the amplitudes of the waves add together when the waves meet at a point, and that's the superposition principle. And sometimes that means that there appears to be no waves at all. And sometimes that means that there's a lot of waves, or the waves are much, much larger. So the two sources of waves, when they meet, that adds, that adds them together, their amplitudes add together linearly, which means they don't multiply together, they don't exponentiate together, they simply add together. And that adding of waves is what, as combined with the fact that they're spreading out, is what Young saw on the far side with his detector on the other side of the barrier with the two slits in it. And that was, a, was the beginning of the confirmation of the wave theory of light. All right, so we're not quite done with Newton's idea yet because Newton had some kind of other explanations for light, but let's, go, let's keep going with this and see how long he can hang on. In 1816, just about 12 years later, uh, Fresnel, uh, determined uh, that the, that light was essentially a transverse wave, and so did Thomas Young in 1817. And in 1817, Fresnel worked out the mathematics for diffraction. And so these enormous equations that he worked out, he presented them as a result of the Royal Society saying, we want to solve this problem of diffraction once and all, da da da, da. And so Fresnel worked out the math. It was extraordinarily complicated, but in order to do it, he had to use the wave theories of light, not Newton's corpuscular theories. And everybody judging this competition for figuring out the solution to the diffraction problem, was, they were all Newtonian advocates. They advocated the corpuscular theory. So they had some problems with it. They first dismissed it. But one of the key predictions that Fresnel had is that, is that if you put a barrier in between a source of light and the place you're detecting, and you actually do what Young did, but you have just a small opening and then put a barrier there, it is possible for there to be a bright spot directly behind the barrier, which is really kind of weird. And so that's as a result of diffraction. Now the barrier can't necessarily be huge, like 20 yards across or something, I know that's called a shadow. But if the barrier is small, then you should be able to see a bright spot directly behind the barrier if the, if the slit is narrow, and the barrier in after, and then the block right at, right on the other side of the slit is kind of small, but not too big. And you should be able to adjust the situation so you have a bright spot there with the barrier in bright spot on the far side of the barrier. On the other side of the block, so you have a barrier with a slit, a block, and then where you're detecting it. And if you do it just right, set things up just right, then you should be able to make a bright spot on the far side of the block. And that was a prediction of Fresnel. And everybody was like, ah, oh, this is crazy, that can't happen. But because it's an experiment, and because it was predicted, it was done. And so in 1819, this idea was confirmed. And therefore, it solidified, combined with the double slit experiment and Fresnel's, uh, Fresnel's diffraction, solution of diffraction ideas, the, the solution of the diffraction problem, Newton's corpuscular theory of light was completely destroyed. Well, to some extent. We'll find that in a different form, it rises back up in the 20th century due to a guy named Albert Einstein. Uh, but in any event, the corpuscular theory as Newton described it no longer explained sufficiently everything that was out there. So that, that put the nail in the coffin for, for Newton's theory of light. That was 1819, a good hundred years after, after Newton uh, did his work. All right, so in 1821, it, uh, Fresnel and Young advanced even further. They proved that all light was a transverse wave and had no longitudinal component. Before then, people thought that uh, there was a, well, how did waves work? If we do sound waves, remember sound waves are compression waves where things compress, and you can have transverse waves like water waves going up and down. You can even have uh, side to side transverse waves. So there's two kinds of transverse waves. Well, actually, well, we can think of, we can think of there being two kinds of waves. Waves of pressure going in and out as the wave progresses in a direction, or we can think that waves wave up and down 
perpendicular to the orientation, to the direction in which they're traveling, like water waves. Water waves, though, don't go left and right as they traverse down the, traverse across the ocean. They only go up and down. Now, they might go side to side as they collide and the sea foam sprays everywhere, but, in gen but uh, waves go up and down as they go, and that's called transverse, transverse to the propagation of motion. Well, what is found is that light can be transverse in any direction to, its pr to the motion, to its motion, to its uh, direction of motion. So if light can be a transverse wave, up and down, side to side, back and forth, so it can go like this or like that or like this as it's going towards you. So those are transverse components or perpendicular to the direction of motion. So why did they think this? And that's because in 1821, Fresnel showed that this would explain the behavior of calcite crystals. Remember them for last time? Calcite crystals form double images, and if you take one calcite crystal and rotate it with respect to the other, the image behind the image of the thing on the far side disappears. Well, that's the reason, is because the structure of the crystals acts like little picket fences. And what's a picket fence? Okay, so a picket fence is just a series of slats, a series of Young's double slits, a slits. And so light can only pass through the slit if its transverse wave is going in the same direction as the slit. So that's really interesting. We call this polarization. And polarization is the idea that the light has an orientate, it can be for, it can, it has a distinct orientation for its transverse component. Like I said, it can go any direction, right? But if we then put a barrier, like, like uh, Thomas Young's double slit experiment, or just even a single slit, then light only, if this long slit like this, then the light can only go through if it has the same orientation of its transverse wave as the size of the slit. Now, if the slit's really big compared to the wave, to the amplitude or wavelength of light, then it can make it through in any direction. But if it's longer, then the slit will determine which way it can go through. Just in the same way that a frisbee thrown at a picket fence. The frisbee, if it's going end over end, can slide between the slats of the picket fence. But if it's going flat like a frisbee normally does, it gets blocked by the picket fence. So when you're playing frisbee and you want to make a scoring box, maybe you want to throw it into a box, you take the picket fence idea and you turn it on its side. Then you have slats going like this. Then the frisbee can, throw, can go in between the slats. If the picket fence is going up and down, meaning the slats are like this, like a ladder, then the frisbee can go in between the slots. But if the picket fence is like on the side of a road in front of a house, then as you throw the frisbee at the picket fence, it can't go between the slats because it's long and the slats are narrow. So the frisbee is polarized flat to the ground and the picket fence around somebody's house is the slats are polarized up and down perpendicular to the ground. So a frisbee can't go in unless you, unless you finesse it or English it and it goes in the right perfect way and then everybody thinks you're really cool for being able to do that. But in any event, polarization was described as the idea that since light has a transverse component of waves, not a longitudinal wave, meaning it doesn't pulse back and forth as it comes towards you or away from you, or in the direction of motion that it goes, it doesn't go like this along the direction of motion doesn't compress as long as it goes. It only has a transverse component. Then we can use the fact of the transverse component of the wave to explain polarization. And polarization is then how we have this picture of light. As it travels, it has these, long these longitudinal components, meaning up and down or side to side components to the light wave. And that's where that picture comes from, is the necessity of explaining, explaining polarization. Well. That's a big, big, big step into the understanding of the nature of light. And next time, we'll talk about the contribution, even more contributions from 19th century science as people discover more and more aspects. And we're going to see how Michael Faraday and others uh, contributed to that knowledge next time. We'll see you soon.